faces from lab around here, and that this room isn't like completely full. Hi guys. Um, but yeah, as Tom talked about, we're gonna I'm gonna be walking you through vertebrate diversity, and as the kind of title hints out, and I'll see the laser pointer very well, it's fishes the whole time, fishes all the way down, all the vertebrates. Um, are fishes. Um, I'm not a fan of paraphyletes, to be honest, um, paraphyletic groupings, and uh, there's going to be a handful of times where you're going to see that um, in the lecture. But yeah, I don't really have a good introduction. I don't have like a fun video to like segue us into like what's going on here. So the first thing I guess that I want to like, talk about with vertebrates is uh, it's really like it's very kind of simple, like dichotomous structure to the the vertebrate the vertebrate tree. Um, there's a vertebrate tree um, in your textbooks that I think um, covers um, those kind of major groupings pretty well, and that's what I used at least to develop this. And the first kind of split that we see in vertebrates, the first kind of like major thing is uh, our jaws, um, vertebrate jaws specifically. Uh, it's, it's a very, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but it's a, a very important aspect of um, the diversity of vertebrates that we see. Jaws are a, a very big component. So let's start off with the vertebrates. We have those, the cyclostomata. Uh, cyclostomata are these um, hagfish and lampreys. Um, you'll see why they're called hagfish in a second. They don't have, you know, they're not the most charismatic looking organisms. Um, and lampreys, slightly more charismatic, but still pretty creepy. And they lack most of the recognizable characteristics that you think of as fish. They are still fish. They are just not, they, they don't look like fish. They don't have jaws. They don't have scales. Their vertebra are pretty reduced, at the very least. They're missing their lateral line, which is a pretty big component uh, that you see in a lot of fishes. If you've ever looked at the side of a fish, you'll see kind of like dark lines streaking across the side. And that's called a lateral line complex. It allows the fish to kind of feel what's going on in its environment. There's pressure from various like organisms moving around in the water hit this lateral line system. Um, the fish kind of has an idea of what's around it. If you've ever seen like a, um, like a Marvel TV show like Daredevil, it's kind of like that, or if you've ever watched Avatar The Last Airbender, um, it's kind of similar. It's not quite the same. And they're also missing their paired fins. So these are eel-like, kind of worm-like creatures um, that are just a tube, more or less. And at least of the expanse lineages um, that we have like around us today, there's two main groups. It's these mixinis, which are um, hagfishes, and petromyzontidae, which is all of our lampreys. Um, I think this starts off with hagfish. Yeah, so if you guys, rem if you guys remember from days ago in lab, we looked at um, cephalochordates, this kind of protochordate group. And the cyclostomata is kind of like a halfway point in between our normal vertebrates and fishes. And that you can see um, this mouth surrounded by kind of these loose uh, barbell appendages, analogous to like an oral hood. Um, it's very similar. Uh, we see um, these external gill openings. There's a lot of them. These guys, they go all the way around. And we see slag lines. I think we all remember um, the endostyle from Laos. Um, and so it's the same thing here. It's, uh, these guys produce loads and loads of slime. All cartilage, no bone. Bone is something, it, it's kind of special, a unique evolutionary feature of uh, certain types of fishes that we'll talk about uh, later. But these guys are scavengers. Um, so if you've ever seen videos of a whale fall in the bottom of the ocean, you'll find tons and just tons of these guys um, scavenging, ripping the dead flesh from uh, the corpses. And they use these slime glands to, for a few different things. Um, not only does it to help them escape the predators, these guys are very elusive and they produce a lot of slime. If a shark or any other larger organism wanted to take a snap at them, they would more than likely get a mouthful of slime more than uh, a hagfish. And that can cause lots of issues with, uh, with their gills, especially in uh, bony fishes. They don't have really developed eyes, as you can kind of see in the side room. Um, they just kind of like moving their way, barely sensing um, their environment. Um, but they 
through there is more like light sensing than an actual lens with um, how we probably think of like camera eyes. And you know, their spawning um, me mechanism, this is more for left to contrast them to um, land rays and petromyzontidae. These guys lay a few, uh, 30 or so very large eggs. Um, and that tells us a bit about um, their life history and their ecology is that they're more or less once these eggs are laid, um, they're on their own. They, parents put a lot of investment into these large eggs in order to ensure um, healthier offspring. They have, yeah, so they have some aspects of fin. They have a caudal fin, but this isn't a pair of fin. So if you think of like a dorsal fin on a fish, on a shark, it's not a pair of appendage. There isn't an opposite one to that. Um, but these guys do have this caudal fin around us. Mouth surrounded by barbels, and we'll see a, a better picture of the mouth in a second here. But these guys, if you get a chance, if we get a chance to see any catfish during our trip to the museum, you'll see these pores pretty well, and it is, it's kind of crazy how they just line the sides of these fishes, or these cat fishes. So yeah, they're scavengers, and as such, um, they don't have jaws. They just kind of have this strange-looking tongue with teeth. I'm using the image from the textbook here because the actual thing is kind of terrifying, and I don't want to scare you guys, honestly. Um, but yeah, these um, sharp teeth on this tongue kind of like rip and scrape off the um, flesh of the organisms that they're scavenging off of. So, no jaws, we're in cyclostomatis at all. Now we're getting to the lampreys. I think if you've grown up in Michigan, or at least in the Great Lakes region, you've heard a lot about these guys, or if you've, I'm sure if you've taken any kind of ecology class at the university here, you've heard a lot about um, lampreys. They can be marine, or freshwater fit um, lampreys. Um, the most kind of common one around here that you'll hear about is uh, sea lamprey, Petromyzon marinus, is pictured here. And kind of opposite to um, the hagfish is these like reduced number of gill pores. Um, they have some very well developed eyes, which you can see right here on this guy. Um, and I think we all have this conception. Um, or at least I feel that it's kind of a big conception around here that um, lampreys are bad. Um, they're not. Um, sea lampreys happen to be um, parasitic. Um, Michigan actually has a, um, a species of brook lamprey that's actually really important to our ecosystem. And if you go out west, there's all sorts of lampreys out there that um, are really endangered due to things like um, dam building and not having access to the spawn. These guys are dioecious and semel pairs. They spawn once, and that's it. It's um, similar to salmon. Um, they will go into up into the rivers to spawn, release their eggs, and they release thousands at a time. Not all that bad. We have, um, like I said, Brookline Ray, Michigan, at the very least, that um, are not parasitic. But these thousands of eggs, um, something to touch on is if you go to a river, um, I'm not quite sure when they're spawning. In the fall. You go into a river in the fall, you see some lamprey swimming around. What you'll often see is dozens and dozens of smaller fishes and minnows trailing behind them because as these guys are spawning their eggs and their sperm, we have native fishes who are feeding off of them. So as the current carries these eggs further down along the river, we have um, large schools of, well, they're not actually schools, but large groups of um, our native freshwater uh, river fish, river bean fish that. Have found a way to reduce them, kind of reduce the numbers um, by um, predating on these eggs kind of right off the get go. Like right from the jump, these guys are off to a rough start. Yeah, so this is the cycle, the life cycle I think that most of us are familiar with uh, for sea lion prey, where they have this adult form that does nothing but attach onto a fish, kind of vampirically suck its blood. Um, and then, yeah, they, they reproduce in these kind of large groups and streams, and like, it almost looks like they're fighting as they like try and like grapple one another and release sperm and egg in an attempt to, to get more of that fertilization to occur. And then most of their life is spent in the sediment as these amicids. Um, and these amicids look very, very similar to cephalochordates. Um, 
probably even more so than the hagfish. They have this kind of like hooded mouth that's very similar to the oral hood of our cephalochordates. And they filter feed as well, um, although not quite to the same um, extent but, uh, as I as we talked about in lab, this filter feeding process um, is, is very reminiscent of how um, cephalochordates uh, feed. No picture of a petromazon bay mount because those are even more terrifying than hagfish mount. And that's kind of it for cyclostomata. There's only two main groups. Honestly, it's just hagfish and lamprey. And there's not really much to them. They don't, they either scavengers or parasitize. There's not a whole lot of diversity in these groups. And personally, I attribute that to the fact that they are lacking jaws. Going into uh, our jaw group, Nathostomata, um, we see this is where most of our diversity is. Um, this is from a paper that was published in 2015 that kind of shows the diversity of vertebrates. You see at the, up at the top um, our cyclostomata group, this out, out group, it counts for a very, 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 very small percentage of the total number of species in, in vertebrates. And everything south of mixiniforms has a jaw. And so the, the jaws allow for this huge diversification. Um, a diversification of different feeding habits, a diversification of lifestyle and the diversification of kind of morphology. Origin of jaws is really big. And if you take the biology of fishes courses uh, here at the uh, University with uh, Professor Hernan Lopez Hernandez, he will talk your ear off about how important jaws are. So within Nathostomata, within our jaw or jaw vertebrate group, we have two kind of main groups of fishes from here. We have our non-bony cartilaginous chondrichthyan fish, which are sharks, our skates, and our rays. Then we have osteichthys. Oste meaning bone, ichthys um, meaning fish, or bony fish. Chondrichthys, cartilage, ichthys, fish. Makes sense. I think we talked we talk about this. And most of the diversity is located not within chondrichthyans. Chondrichthyans contribute a very small proportion to the overall diversity of vertebrates. But actually, it's in the bony fishes is where we see this huge diversity. Um, and we keep finding fishes. We keep thinking that we have an idea of how many fishes there are, and we keep getting proven wrong. At one point, we thought we found them all, most of them. There's only about 30,000 or so species. And then we keep finding more and more and more. So this number right here is probably not right. There's likely a higher amount of uh, species diversity in, in Actinopterygia alone, let alone all the other uh, groups that we'll talk about later. So chondrichthys are sharks, skates, rays, and chimeras. Uh, Tom showed a really cool video of a chimera in class the other day, and I, I was gonna, I think I'm gonna have a video, but it uh, shows up a more stereotypical um, chimera. And there's two kind of key characteristics that distinguish chondrichthians from all the other fishes and from bony fishes is um, the way that their um, skeleton calcifies. So as the name hints, they are cartilaginous. But cartilage in and of itself isn't the strongest um, material. Um, sharks are, sharks get to these kind of pretty large organisms that need a lot of structural support. And so there is slight calcification of, of the skeleton. Um, and this is one of this type of calcification called prismatic endoskeleton calcification is uh, this method in which um, the outer layer of the cartilage is, is kind of coated in, uh, in enamel that gives it um, slight properties of bone even though it is still mostly cartilage just on the surface of the cartilage, which is calcification happens. And they also have internal fertilization, which is really unique. I, I think up until this point, we've seen only spawning occur. Um, this, what this picture shows is the claspers that are present in chondrichthyans. They kind of look like penises, to be honest, pretty phallic. Um, 
but they do have internal fertilization and they do give them a lot of species of convictions get live birth. They and they gestate their young inside of them, which is kind of tricky if you consider it. Most fish will lay eggs and have it externally, and we usually only think about internal fertilization with kind of tetrapods or even more specifically than animals really. They have these really cool scales, and I hope I have a picture of it. Um, placoid scales um, that are made of cartilage, and it's very rough. If you ever get a chance to feel a shark, you rub your hand over it, smooth one way, and then a very like high, low grid sand going the other way. And here's these placoid scales. You see this enamel and benzene that makes up of the base of these scales. And this enamel is what I was talking about when we're seeing this um, initial endoprismatic um, calcification um, that occurs throughout the rest of the body. And yeah, so look up close, this is what the surface of a shark will look like. These kind of very um, unique placoid scales that almost resemble some of the uh, species within the interfeeding group. This almost looks like um, a like ray of some sort. And they have a lot of diversity here that we've developed a jaw now. We have, we have a jaw of these interfeedings. And so we have a few new feeding mechanisms. We can chew, chew, we can close a jaw on the drain and capture it. But we don't have teeth yet, or at least kind of very early teeth, which just are extended scales. Um, we'll see that a uh, picture of this when we get to one of the subgroups of interfeedings. But these scales are actually modified in a lot of these organisms um, to become teeth, extend, extended um, teeth. And as their scales, the teeth, um, you would think uh, a lot of us have heard like the, the common story that sharks are always growing teeth and are always losing teeth. It's because it's just some, it's like a scale. It's growing and dropping and growing and dropping. And they don't really have to worry about it placing teeth, and that's now a huge investment for them. And so in chondrichthians, there's two main groups. Our holocephali, which um, are the chimeras that we saw on Monday, and then the labyrinths, which is the shark skating, right, is the rest of them. So we're going to start off with the freakiest one, that is um, holocephali, or chimeras. And even more so than the last number, these um, chimeras have this super complex lateral sensory system that's kind of centralized to their head. We have a head now, we have cephalization, and so a lot of the sensory organs are paired up here. Um, it's slightly different to elasmer rings, which have um, structures, um, but uh, sharp skates and rings have a kind of analogous structure. But they, this complex lateral sensory system in their head allows them to um, pick up on uh, small electrical signals and allows them to get a better understanding of their environment. This might be the same. Is this a video now? No, it's not. So this is from a smart eye research aquarium. Oh, it's going to zoom in here. Let's pause. You can see this lateral line goes all the way down the side of the centrixian. You see all these small dots that go around the head, and those are where these, this, this, these sensory organs are, is in these um, small openings. So they can sense the other chemical changes occurring in the water, and uh, they have really well developed eyes. Uh, they call these uh, ghost fish, um, ghost sharks, um, and they kind of look almost as the way they kind of glide through the water using the pectoral fin. It's almost like wings. Um, and it's actually not that far off as to what's happening. Uh, Chondrichthians don't have a gas bladder. You know? If you know anything about fish, gas bladders are really important as to how we support ourselves, uh, how fish is support themselves in maintain buoyancy in the water. These guys have pectoral fins that are very large and long, um, very similar to wings in, um, in, terms of, in terms of hydrodynamics of what's going on here. Um, so you know, similar concepts of like an angle of attack help keep these fish where they want to be in the water column. Um, they uh, 
and drip feeds on wholesome, usually have a fat, really fatty liver. Um, that helps them do this as well. It gives up their slot. Low density feed on. Um, so different kinds of feeds here. Um, it's plates. We, we don't see these scales that are growing and falling out and um, grasping out of organisms. Um, they use these plates. Um, to, like, you'll see videos of these guys just like kind of chomping into harder um, organisms, cleaving them, breaking them up um, before um, consuming them. These guys are pretty cool if you want to study them. There's not a whole lot of researchers here do them who study pancreas. Um, pancreas in general, but and he's pretty underrepresented in the research that goes on here. Um, so this is, these are really cool species to check out. And then our last membranes, these are our shark skates and rays. And I point this out that they have traditional gills. Um, we see these external gill slits um, on the slide that I think most of us envision a fish having. Although, in, as we'll see in um, hop species, those gill slits are usually covered by what's called perculum. Um, and here's this tooth shed I was talking about. So as these scales kind of grow, um, these placoid scales grow, and are purposed in the fish, they have a purpose in the teeth. Um, they get these larger amounts of enamel on the surface, and then as they are used and continue to grow, they fall off. We see what's um, the rostrum is pointed out in this diagram. Um, and so similar to the, these kind of complex lateral sensory organs, uh, sensory systems that we see in chimeras, sharks have uh, what are called ampullae of Lorenzini. And you don't, I'm not going to say that's important that you know how to spell that or anything, but they do have um, equally complex um, sensory organs in their head, which is why if you've ever seen like a how to survive a shark attack video, they say, you know, punch the nose, because it's really sensitive for these organisms. They have a lot of nerves here going on that's telling them information about their environment, what chemicals are in the water. Um, they, they, it's where you hear hit the expression that sharks can smell blood. They can't really smell blood, but they can pick up on changes in um, uh, vibrational frequencies in the water. They can pick up on some chemical changes. I'm not sure of the extent of that. Um, external gill slits, and pay attention to this caudal fin back here. Um, we'll see in a lot of our uh, osteopian friends, um, caudal fins that are um, equally long on both sides. And this is uh, another component that helps us with understanding how these guys stay afloat in the water column. They have a huge liver internally. Um, they have a really fatty liver. Um, fat is very water, buoyant in water. And because these guys, as you can see, don't have a gas bladder of any kind. They have stomachs, kidneys, heart, aorta, uh, pancreas, intestines, everything that you would expect to see in a fish, except for the gas bladder. Normally up at the top, it would be this huge open space for a gas bladder to keep them buoyant. Instead, they have very fatty livers. They have tails that tails and large pectoral fins that help them maintain um, hydrodynamic lift in the water. And it's a really unique way that these organisms have uh, adapted and figured out how to live within the water column. And drink bands are pretty cool. see the video people. Although I'm not someone who studies chondrifians. I my whole domain is right here, not stapians. And this is where the rest of us are too. The rest of the vertebrates, well yeah, the rest of the vertebrates are all here, not stapians. So this is where the majority of our time is going to be spent. So osteopathies, we have bones now. So how are these bones kind of forming? Uh, this is a slide from a presentation that Matt Friedman gave uh, to the biology of fish class a few years ago. Um, and we see this kind of the top and bottom scale. Does I see that on the scale? Okay. So this non osteopathy, this is what we might expect um, shark um, ossification or calcification to look like. We see this kind of 
some enamelation that's occurring on the outside, but that's it. We just have this enamel that's forming, um, or enameloid, I guess, supposedly. I don't know, time, so I can't tell where the dentine is, but so it's uh, yeah, super important. And then on our osteophene fish, we have this complete um, ossification that happens. It happens internally. Um, it goes from the inside out. Um, so as uh, this enamel is excreted, the cartilage, which, every, which starts off as, um, slowly solidifies into bone as we kind of recognize it in ourselves and in most of the, the tetrapods. Oh, gosh. We get a gas bladder now. And this can take up uh, two different forms. In our actinopterygii, our ray thin fishes, this takes the form of a gas bladder or a swim bladder. It helps them maintain buoyancy and overcome. So opposite to sharks, they don't have to have a super fatty liver, but they do need something that is much more buoyant than fat because they have this ossification that's happening. The dent, we talked about this on Monday, the density of their bones is increasing, and they need these gas bladders to stay full. They have inside out endochondral calcification that occurs, and this completely changes it from um, a cartilage to an actual bone. Actinopterygii, um, it's a reef in fishes. We, we saw on that slide earlier that um, this is where a lot of the diversity is. Sarcopterygiums um, is what contains our tetrapods and our mammals, our amphibians, um, reptiles, all that fun stuff. Um, but a lot of the diversity is in here. Pay attention to this slide because it's going to be important a little bit later. But we see the ray finned fishes, they have rays in their fins. These, uh, this is a slide from Hernan uh, Lopez Hernandez. So, uh, those of you who've taken biology and fish probably recognize this. Swim the ladders for buoyancies, and these thin rays is what's supporting their fins. There is muscular attachment, is these pectorals that um, allow, um, that, that keep the fins um, kind of in one piece. And there's huge diversity in this group, and we'll only briefly touch on this. Um, I would love to spend the next like hour talking about like Neopterygians or Chondrosians. Um, but uh, I feel like I'd be stealing the biology of issues across this stuff for you know, you see these caudal rays, and this is a, the similar, um, the same kind of like format that is occurring in all of our thin complexes in ray thin fishes. Um, this is a connection just kind of directly to the spinal column right here. We see um, our first look at an actual vertebrae. It's a yellow perch, or at least a diagram of a yellow perch. We see some familiar things going on. We see the vertebrate, the vertebrae happening. We see um, the spinal cord. Mine ears, which we saw in our cephalochordates, have been retained as a, a muscul as a form of musculature. We see the actual them close. The liver is much more reduced than in the interfaces. And we see the rays very well. Called bifurcating rays that um, stick out of our most of our fins, unless you have spines, from which the rays themselves have fused and calcified even more. So that's our, probably a general overview of what's going on here. We see these kind of dashed lines. This is our lateral line complex that we see, or that we rather don't see in cyclothermata, that allow them to kind of sense what's going around, going on in their environment. Um, so yeah, actinopterygians, this is where most of our diversity, the fishes lie, is right in here, um, in this plate. Let's go back just a little bit, just to give context. So, our ray fin fishes have two groups, you see there's a lot of two groups, we are just going to keep going down the line in groups of two. Um, we have neopterygians, which is our, our, our new fish, I guess you would call them neon, our new ray fishes, um, and our new thin fishes, and our chondrosti. Can you see this word again? The chondrosti guy, which is really weird um, because that would suggest both ossification and 
These are bony fin fishes that have lost um, the ossification of the bones. They have placoid scales similar to pinterthians. They have these very large pectoral fins. This is a juvenile, uh, this is a juvenile lake sturgeon that I got the chance to do on all the lakes back into the Sturgeon River um, a few years ago. And the congestia yeah, kind of are two kind of groups within here, and I won't go any like, further down into the rabbit hole of congestia. Um, those of you who are in my lab are going to recognize this video here after we watch. So the kind of sister group to our sturgeon are what are these called paddlefish? This is a North American freshwater paddlefish. There's other kinds of paddlefish. But we see that these look very similar to sharks. Um, we, uh, if you know, like saw sharks have these really long noses, or even the long nose chimera that we saw in Montreal Monday. Um, you know, these guys look very similar. We um, have kind of large pectoral fins that help um, keep them buoyant. They have a really unique feeding strategy, though, is that they can open their mouth huge like that. These guys are filter feeders, and they will swim through the water column like that with their jaw and mouth wide open and filter organic material and um, organic particles through their gills and through their gill racers. Um, and that's how they feed. You can see he's kind of chewing there. It's not actually chewing, but he's more just like bringing the organic uh, material down into his gullet. Those things are really cool. Um, you get a chance to work with sturgeon or with um, uh, the tribes in the area. Um, the tri tribal um, fishers do a lot of work in trying to restore sturgeon populations. So, neopterygians are kind of more modern fish. So, our perches, our salmonids, um, all of the fishes that like. You probably think of first before you think of a sturgeon, before you think of a paddlefish, before you think of a shark. These are those fishes. Um, they, the kind of important thing to know about these guys is they have what's called a, uh, a maxilla, or well, we guess we all have a maxilla. But in neopterygian, it's mobile. Um, and in the subgroup Holosteii, I have a picture that will show this really well. Um, and the main diversification here is in their jaws. Going down further into our fish rabbit hole here, um, as we see more and more diverse groups, it's mostly because of the diversification in their jaw that happens. Um, their ability to uh, suction feed um, is greatly improved by having this mobile maxilla um, and the coronoid process, which is like the, the arch at the back of the jaw, um, help, really helps to create um, the suction feeding mechanism, which is what most of our fishes use to, to feed. They don't, those fishes don't bite, they instead just open their mouth really wide and suck their prey in. The two kind of main groups within our modern fishes um, are artelioists and are non -teleosts. Um And we, these are some kind of holosteia, very like, old groups. We only see holosteia in North America, actually. This is something that's really unique to um, our part of the continent. Um, Bofin and Gar, I think you know, both, most of us know what a guard is, but both and I didn't really know what they, those were until um, I took a field course. Um, Holosteia yeah, had these ganoid scales, which are kind of diamond shaped scales. Um, you can't really see the scale shape too well, but these di diamond shaped ganoid scales um, cover most of these fishes um, and restrict it from their blood. This is a both end over here on the right. And this is what I'm talking about with our mobile maxilla is in uh, the other group um, in, in older lineages. This can't move. This is adhered to the, the roof of their mouth. And if you would imagine um, in this living organism, this would all be covered with skin. And if you were to take a cross section of that, it would form a, a more perfect circle than if you didn't have a mobile maxilla. Both of them are really cool. Um, this is one that I took a picture of, um, again, on that same field course. 
Um, they have these tubercle noses, um, this really striking pattern, at least when they're juveniles, um, and this very large uh, dorsal fin um, that they use to um, help them move. They actually don't uh, particularly um, undulate as a type of motion. They don't move their whole body. They instead um, just move this fin and the rest of their fins are there to help keep them um, hydrodynamically stable. You know, all these notes of dolphin are two things. These are tubercle nostrils, tubes poking out of their nose that you can see there, and a very like, dark black spot at the top of their, at the top of their um, caudal fin. Um, I think once you see these guys in, a, in like, the wild, in a lake around here, you'll never be able to unsee them because they're absolutely massive. This is um, the slide pack summary. I had a chance to do some sampling for the DNR. This is a, a boat fin that we have to collect. Um, I just want to point out that this is small. This is juvenile. These things are ancient and they are absolutely massive when they get to their full size. Um, and this thing was, I don't know if you can get the scale, but easily was this big. Um, these guys are just absolute dinosaurs. And our teleosts. We have here kind of like the rest of the diversification of our fishes going on. We see different kinds of scales happen or occurring rather. We have um, kind of smaller scales that are, uh, are there to kind of provide less protection against you know, the large teeth of organisms and more so um, it, it's, it's very reduced in Telios species. Um, Telios have something that's called PSWGD. For those of you who haven't taken the biology of fishes courses, do you have any guesses? what that stands for. It's the Telios specific, so only for Telios, whole genome, genome duplication. Their entire genome has undergone um, a duplication of it. So they have twice the uh, second pair of all their genes, and that allows them to diversify even more. There's more room for um, mutations to occur, um, there's more room to play around, so to say, with uh, your genotype and your phenotype. They have a mobile pre-maxilla, which I don't have any very good pictures of, um, but I feel bad. So this is their maxilla, and their pre-maxilla is this kind of bone structure right at the top of the nose. Um, and in, uh, in Telios, it's very mobile. Um, if you've ever a bluegill, you know that if you take its lip, you can kind of pull it forward, and it really extends out, extends out too far. Again, this is a feeding um, adaptation. This helps them suction feed better. So they open their mouth, the premaxilla extends, the pupil cavity opens up, um, the vacuum occurs, it sucks prey in. This feeding strategy also kind of limits them in their, their diversity um, in their lifestyle because fishes that do this can only um, eat what they can fit in their mouth. They can't chew or take bites of something unless you have a specialized adaptation for them, like um, piranhas, for example. So teleos is where most of our diversity lies within the mobile premaxilla and these kind of really thin, flaky scales, uh, cycloid to tingly shaped scales. And I work with a lot of these guys. Um, so this guy is um, Creek chub, oh, I mean, sorry, yeah, this is creek chub, Sonatellus atramaculatus. Um, these guys live in pretty uh, rough uh, rivers around the state. And this is a pumpkin seed. Um, actually, this is a hybrid between a pumpkin seed and a bluegill. Um, they, these guys don't like the biological species concept. They can never use them. Um, but you can tell that it's, um, well, I haven't given it to this because I feel like that's a bit uh, too specific. I love fishes, so. though. Um, this is a log perch, which is a really kind of like unique um, darter species, perch species. Um, yeah, we see, um, if you go up to the Ohio Station, these guys are all, all around Lake Dakotas. And this is, um, I'm not sure what this is. Yeah, this is the uh, estates of some kind, but I don't know if those days. But that's our Helios. This is, most of the diverse, most of the diversity of our fishes lies within 
within actinopterygii, within our neopterygii, and then within our teleos. Um, that explains, I'd say, the vast majority of the length of this bar up here. And now we have to leave my domain. I'm really sad that I can talk about this for like another 40 minutes. But this now gets into the rest of the vertebrates. It's our sarcopterygians, or our lobe finned fishes. They're still bony, they still have bones, they still have that um, internal palpitation that happens. But we see that their gas bladders, is, or, yeah, their gas bladders instead of being used for buoyancy swimming bladders, they're used more for lungs. Um, uh, sarcopterygians. Lobes, fishes, these lobes uh, can contain larger bones. We recognize, or at least you know, some human anatomy, the radius and ulna that is in our forearms, <coughs> humerus, our phalanges, and our fingers. Um, these all originate with sarcopterygians, with um, things like coelacanths, or this really long word I don't expect you guys to know. But coelacanths are um, a really, I think, interesting species to talk about because for the longest time, we thought that they were extinct. These, um, these fishes have been resurrected, so to say. Um, we thought that we didn't find any until 1938. There's a fossil record. We thought that they went extinct some 66 million years ago. But they're alive and well, kind of in the, the Indo-Pacific, um, the coast of Madagascar, um, Indonesia. Um, though they're high, pretty highly endangered, um, there's not a whole ton, too, much, too many of these guys up. I don't know like, what the book is doing with this image here, but it's not doing um, coelacanth any justice. Um, but the coelacanth that we uh, see here, um, these things are very large, um, very old um, fishes that uh, are kind of the sister group that connects the rest of the tetrapods to fishes and uh, fishes and the rest of the vertebrates. Let's see if I can the process. Yes, no, So this is kind of like um, a super grouping of two of uh, our tetrapods and our dipnomorphs, our lung fishes and our tetrapods, or four legged animals. Um, this kind of looks, I, I feel like a German invented this word because it looks like they just kind of smashed it all together. But um, starting with our lung fishes. So this is the last we'll see of most of our um, fish like organisms are these lung fishes. And these guys are, I don't know, they're absolutely bizarre to me. Um, so they're lung fishes, they breathe air, they use their lungs like these bizarre lungs. But they still live in the water, they're our closest relatives. Um, and these guys have a huge genome. They're not teleos. They haven't gone to teleo-specific whole genome duplication, but they have the largest genome of any vertebrate. There's only six species of, the, uh, of uh, lung fishes. Have 130 gigabytes worth of um, DNA and um, genetic code. And for reference, we only have about three gigabytes. I don't know what these guys are doing. They're hoarding all of the genetic information for something, but uh, these guys have really long, kind of um, wisp like um, pectoral fins and um, pelvic fins uh, that they kind of use. Um, help them move around the water. Remember, these guys are sarcopterygians. They have um, very large bones, they're very dense. Um, they kind of stay low in the water column. Um, and so these low fins and there help them move around a little bit as they're navigating being these kind of denser organisms. A little bit ahead, slow down. And I'll go back to fishes at the end of this. So our tetrapods. So this is most of our favorite animals of that. I don't know if uh, Diana's lab section was any different, but I think you know, everyone in both of my lab sections listed their favorite animal as, a, as a, some form of tetrapod, either a snow leopard or a peregrine falcon, a red-tailed hawk, um, rabbits, mice, mammals, um, all the lizards. Um, if you have four legs, or at least if you used to have four legs, you're a tetrapod. Do we remember our adaptations to survive on land from, from Monday? These guys, 
needs to, at least that person needs to be dependent on water. Um, uh, they need to find a way to survive without water because these are our first vertebrate like colonization of land. Um, this is a, a new territory that we're stepping into. And kind of the closest I think we're going to get um, to kind of understanding that with uh, the tetrapods is amphibians. Um, they have lungs, um, although you know, depend, they use a combination of breathing through their skin um, or using their lungs. And amphibians are still dependent on the water. We have um, three kind of main groups of amphibians that we're going to talk about. Um, gym, gymnosiona, which is Celiums, uracella, which are salamanders, and aneurum, which just are frogs and toads. And when you guys go to the RMC tomorrow or on Friday with me, uh, you're going to hopefully meet Tom Greg Schneider. Ask him all the questions you have about amphibians and reptiles because that is his area of expertise, and he will gladly talk to you about them. So, Cecilians. Um, there's not, I don't know too much about these guys in, in all honesty. They're limbless organisms. Um, so we lost, starting off tetrapods really well with the organism that doesn't have any limbs. Um, these guys are kind of worm or snake like burrowing creatures. Um, we usually don't think of them as amphibians because we usually don't see these guys. They spend most of their lives underground um, and kind of hiding away um, from most activity. They don't have any limbs. Or, I'm imagining they're not very mobile. But these guys are really just unique um, amphibians that I don't think most of us think about when we think of amphibians. This is the only picture in our textbook, or at least pictures I have from our textbook that have um, Sicilians. But you can see they kind of have these, they almost look like snakes. They have these like plate structures that allow them to slither and move through uh, the ground. So this is what I think of when I think of amphibians. This is a sapphire or an axolotl. They have limbs, they have four limbs, so this is actually a tetrapod. Well, the other one was actually a tetrapod too, but this is visibly tetrapodal. Uh, and they have kind of two like main forms of development. They can either directly develop into their adult form from once they hatch into their egg, or hatch from their egg directly into their adult form. Or they have um, a development style called pedomorphy. Um, they're not pedophiles, um, they just retain childlike characteristics. So that's what axolotls are. Um, I need a better picture of an axolotl. Um, so axolotl down here. These guys will more or less stay the same. They uh, have these lung, these um, gills, or extensions of their gills um, uh, that they retain that most um, other amphibians lose, or most other salamanders will lose later on in life. This guy is a, someone that underwent direct development. He's lost any of his uh, larval gills that um, he may have retained. Because remember, these are all fishes still um, in their larval forms. They all have gills. We have gills when we're larva and um, developing uh, is in, in the womb. But um, axolotls undergo um, pedomorphic development where they keep extensions of these um, and they don't, they fully mature, it's just not um, in the way you would expect them to. My piece is making you guys notes. Making me nervous. When there are frogs, toads, uh, I think Tom talked about this on Monday, but they are lacking tail. Um, maybe this is what most of you think of when you think of amphibians. Um, skin breathers, they go through this um, diaphasic um, life cycle where they hatch from their eggs into um, tadpoles before maturing into adults. Um, frogs and toads, I, I don't think there's much to talk about. But there's a lot of diversity in frogs and toads. There's um, a lot of cool toads and frogs out there, especially in um, the global south, um, in like, uh, places like um, in the tropical or tropical rainforests. I'm not well versed in amphibians, but I'm not well. I'm not So tetrapods kind of have two main groupings that they are either amphibians or they're amniotes. And this distinction has more or less to do with the way that they 
theorems. Amniotes refers to the amniotic thing. Um, so as we move away from being dependent on water, we need a way to retain water. So water is a very important component of life, and so we need a way to keep it in. And that's what this amniotic egg does really well. So we have this kind of partially permeable barrier that keeps water in the egg. Egg on land, water in the egg. They don't need to lay their eggs in the water um, for their young to survive. And we see um, this kind of development of yolk. So, um, so there's more investment by the parents to ensure that, um, that their offspring survives and, and can develop all these nutrient-rich yolk sacs, provide all, all the nutrients that um, a growing embryo needs to survive. We have mouth breathers now, so because we're keeping, we're moving away from water, we need to keep it in. Our skin doesn't let out a whole lot of water, or at least it tries not to. Um, and so as a consequence of that, we can't breathe through our skin, fortunately, like frogs and other amphibians can. But that means we have to develop stronger and more unique lungs. So there's an increased development in lungs as we breathe in air and preserve water. Um, things like um, nitro nitrogen, urea-rich urine that um, helps us um, keep water even when we are excreting it. And so the two main groups within amniotes um, is a diapsis and a synapsis. And this refers to the skull um, that's going on here. So diapsids these are our reptiles. Everything that is a diapsid is a reptile, um, which is going to be a little counterintuitive in a second. Um, but it refers to this kind of morphology of the skull, where we have two openings, two paired openings within the skull. Um, common ancestor between um, diapsids and synapsids um, looks like it only had the orbit or the eye would be. Um, but we see um, the loss of a lot of bone here as um, these lateral and dorsal openings. These are where we see our lizards, our turtles, and our harvesters. Birds are indeed reptiles. I refuse to call them anything else. They're reptiles, they are members of the Ashton. They fall within this crown group. Um, like I said, they're not kind of reptiles. Okay, so I'll, we'll get to some of these guys. Um, and so something interesting is if, um, we, and we've talked about this before, is, right, is your interpretation of who is whose most recent common ancestor, um, who is more closely related to who. This is a picture from our textbook, um, and if you are to believe our textbook, you would so you get the suggestion that archosaurus or crocodiles and birds are most closely related to turtles, um, and then these groups are kind of more, as a whole, equally closely related to um, our typical lizards, or tuataras, or snakes, that kind of thing. I found this um, cladogram from, this is supposedly from 2021 this year, which would suggest that lizards, snakes, and tuataras are most closely related to crocodiles, alligators, and birds. So depending on your understanding of phylogenetics and where we are in understanding how those things, this tree change. So this is probably even more so than amphibians where I have the least expertise. Um, but lepidosaurs are, are reptiles. Um, there's kind of like two main groupings within here that I won't get into, um, which is our squamata, um, which includes snakes, our lizards, um, monitors, um, if you've ever seen like a, a Gia monster that's in the American Southwest, uh, those are lepidosaurs. Um, they have um, kind of these uh, and, uh, ectothermic lifestyle. Um, but what I do want to focus on are two guitarists because they have um, what's called a, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, a perennial third eye on top of their head. So they actually have a fully developed optical eye that has um, retina, it has cornea, it has a lens, so they can they have this third eye that they can use to sense um, the, the surrounding environment. 
And we see remnants of that in our school model um, and some other uh, reptiles more broadly um, has small remnants of um, a spot on the top of their head where this perennial third one would be. Um, two towers more, this is two towers here. It more or less looks like a like regular lizard. Um, just has a third eye on top. They're kind of cool to think about. And so as, uh, click through, as this figure suggests, um, we have a kind of this grouping here of um, test tubes and archosaurs. Um, so it's um, birds and crocs and turtles that I'm not representing here. This is the best I'm representing is because I don't think there's a name for this grouping, or at least if there is, I don't know it. Um, so these are more closely related to each other. There should be in like a smaller bubble, but I don't have any. So for now, all three of these are on the same report. We've seen this word before. We've seen a test before. So the testudines is referring to this kind of fusion of uh, the vertebrae and spine into uh, the shell. Um, helps keep them protected, keeps their internal organs away from all that danger that they treat into. Flexible neck. Um, so they're sharp. They're very hard to get into, very difficult to um, be predated on. We've seen it before, though. This isn't particularly unique. We've seen these in our echinoids. Um, and our echinoids, more specifically, our sea urchins have a test, which is forms in a kind of ancillary way for this, where um, you, you see these um, structures. Echinoids, it's the angulatural grooves, it has pseudonies, it's the vertebrate spine that all fuse and ossify to create a shell to protect their internal organs. We see a loss of teeth in turtles as well, um, and their types of skulls. So even though they are reptiles and their ancestors did have two holes in their head, as you can see from this picture, they only indeed have their orbit. Um, it's single. Um, kind of oral opening in their skull. Um, and kind of a, a unique developmental feature of testudines is um, the sex of their offspring is dependent on the temperature outside. So if uh, the eggs are laid in a particularly cold environment, uh, you would expect to see um, males uh, emerge from those eggs. Or if it, they're, they're incubated and preserved in a very warm environment, they're going to be females. And this is going to be contrasted to um, another group. Um, this guy up here in the top right is um, an alligator snapping turtle. You got uh, if you go to Ohio, these are in all sorts of ponds and lakes in Ohio. I'm not sure if they extend up into Michigan, but I know they're really common in Ohio. You can see these large claws that they use to move through the muck and mud um, of the wetlands that uh, they kind of perforate Ohio. And then you see a very different thing going on over here, where we see these large two lobe fins in the sea turtle um, used for hydrodynamics. If you remember, sharp pectoral fins, large wing like structures that um, help with hydrodynamic lift. There's not much to say about archosaurs as a group other than they're crocs and birds. Um, alligators, crocodiles, hands, all sorts of um, brief diversity. These guys are not anthropomorphic. There might have been a moment of silence for sea world. Growing up, I was always a big fan of the crocodile hunter and watching um, him kind of inspired me to be a biologist or an ecologist in general. So, crocodiles, even though I didn't study them, it was a special place in my heart. And they're almost unchanged from their ancestors from over 100 million years ago. If there's a testament to um, evolution and natural selection being effective, it's these guys. Um, they have uh, are arguably perfect predators. They are, it, may have survived the march of time for millions of years and likely will for millions of years more. And opposite to turtles, actually directly opposite, they 
crocodiles and crocodilia do have temperature-dependent development of their offspring sex. It's just reversed, where warm environments produce males, and cold environments produce females. So, alligator, different from a crocodile, crocodiles have very long narrow snouts. Most of us are in Michigan, so we try to stay away from crocodiles and not avoid people. The other group in our story is birds. So birds and crocodiles are, are closely related, or most closely related to each other. Um, and we see a lot of divergence from our um, normal reptile uh, features. The bones are really hollow. They don't have super strong bones. They have a large heel on their sternum. So if you've ever seen the skeleton of a bird, they have this large kind of extension of their sternum that allows muscular attachment. This is um, something that helps them to fly. Um, so that they don't have these large, very powerful breast muscles. Um, they won't be able to create enough force to create lift to fly. We see, again, the loss of teeth in these um, organisms. And we have a very clear, actually, representation of the loss of teeth as we look in like organisms like Archaeopteryx, um, kind of like um, first birds that, uh, that we study in evolution um, in ornithology do indeed have teeth. Um, but then as we get into more modern lineages, those teeth are lost and they turn more into a beak. And then probably the most important um, feature here is uh, feathers. Most of the reptiles, or actually all the other reptiles, are exothermic. Um, they, they cannot regulate their own body temperature. They require the environment to do that for them. And actually, if we go all the way back up from the 80s, all of our fish are exothermic. Our sarcopteridians are exothermic. This is the first bit of endothermy that we actually see, and it's all thanks to their feathers, because feathers are very good at insulator. This is what these pneumatic bones are. Um, so they're very hollow, makes them very light. So we talked about how the ossification of the cartilage skeleton makes for very heavy organisms. So the one way, the only really way to counteract that to get the tongue light enough to fly in the air, let alone the water, is to have hollow pneumatic bones. Um, and these have two, these serve two functions. Uh, one, they um, allow the bird to become less dense to achieve flight, but they also serve as um, their lungs to a certain extent. Um, uh, as um, birds breathe, um, there's a very complex um, gastrural system Say natural, not like digestive, but um, they breathe through their bones. I don't have a very good explanation on the mechanisms of this. You should take ornithology to find out more. Um, but these bones are hollow, and because of that, they use them to assist in breath. So, the skeleton of a bird, you see um, up here is uh, this very large sternum that the breast um, muscle will attach to. Feathers, mandible in our maxilla again, it's not mobile in our, as such in our uh, axonopterygians. So I have the slide up here. Look up at the top here. What is that? Ulna, radius, carpals, primary digits, and we saw that in our pterygians as the first low fin fishes were moving out of the water. Um, we preserved these features. And so this is how I can say confidently that we have evolved that all these organisms are fishes because they're all descended from sarcopterygians. And we see the same features in birds, in tetrapods, that we saw in those early low fishes. And feathers um, are a unique structure. Um, they have this unique kind of formation where they'll bud out of the skin and form a, a protective sheet and then a kind of furl out into this fully grown feather as a sheet is left behind at the bottom. This is what kind of the quill is. They have this, feathers have a really unique structure to them where um, in between different branch like structures um, are these barbs and barbules. If you ask me, I think they should be called pinnacles because that's what they most resemble. Um, but this kind of interlacing um, allows um, the feathers to maintain um, stability and shape through flight, which is really important when you're a bird flying through the air, that your feathers don't get out of line when that everything is smooth, because 
that affects your ability to fly, that affects lift, that affects um, aerodynamics. Um, and there's a huge diversity of feathers um, that are used for either flight or insulation. Um, you are used for special kinds of plumages. If you've ever seen a peacock, those have some very beautiful and very lonely feathers um, that can take a lot of different um, morphological forms. Down, down the feathers, like if you've ever had like a down, like a down coat, um, down feather coat with Canada goose, which is terrible by the way, you should never buy Canada goose, they mystery animals, but um, that's why um, the insulation works so well, that's why these um, birds can be endothermic, is because feathers are such good insulators. Crocs and birds are closely related by piles, um, and they're all within the diopsis group. Now, one Final group here with our synapsids and our skulls. Um, so synapsid meaning, um, well, let me go back to it. Uh, okay. Well, synapsid, they only have one temporal opening in their skull, as opposed to diapsid meaning two. And synapsids are all mammals. This is our plate. This is where uh, we are, this is where most of our um, friends and family are, this is where our best friends, uh, our dogs are, our pets, all sorts of things. And there's some really kind of unique features of mammals that kind of put them way out of the way from the rest of the tetrapods. Most of this whole plate is endothermic. Um, we have fur to help keep us warm, we regulate our own body temperatures. Um, we have differentiated teeth, that, um, you all take your tongue and move it across your teeth. You'll feel molars, you'll go past your incisors, your um, canines. And that's something we don't see in almost any other grouping. Rep uh, reptiles all have homogenous, very um, sharp teeth. Fishes have a diversity of teeth, but they're all the same teeth within a mouth. They don't have different teeth in the same jaw. Um, and that's a kind of unique feature, again, that helps with um, the uh, feeding behavior. And consequently, we get differentiated diets from that. So, organisms that mainly have molars um, are you know, herbivores, um, you know, stronger incisors, the canines, a lot of stuff through the, the, um, the processing of uh, all meat as, um, as predators. And then, the kind of titular feature of synapsids, and well, mammals more specifically, is almost in the name, it's mammals. Mammary glands. They have glands, so whether it's the mammary glands that secrete and produce the milk um, that uh, our young feed off of, or if it's um, sweat. Weird. Synapsids in mammals sweat. Um, not, I don't think any other group can say that they sweat because we have glands. So within mammals, well, within synapsida and kind of mammals more specifically, we have three main groups that I like to talk about in the last couple minutes that we have together. Um, see rabbits, um, which are a really good example of um, how fur helps keep us uh, regulated. You have this differentiation of teeth that um, allows us to uh, have a variety of uh, feeding morphologies, whether it's large molars and incisors um, that are in beavers that allow them to chew up wood. If they're very sharp um, molars and premolars, uh, large incisors and canines, and carnivores like the coyote. Uh, fruit eating organisms like fruit eating bats have these robust teeth that allow them to crush like seeds and hard fruit. Um, or sometimes you get robust of teeth, as in um, the anteater, which doesn't really need teeth to consume food. Or omnivores like us. Um, again, that versatile dentition, versatile dentition. I already talked about glands, so this picture is just to show that we do have um, kind of very unique external layer that um, causes to be tight. So the first group of mammals that we're going to talk about are monotremes. Um, these are our some echidnas and ductile and platypi. Um, this small group, there's only about five or so species in here. Um, and kind of opposite to the rest of the mammals we'll see is um, they don't have any nipples. <laughs> which I think is funny. So when they're feeding their young, they just secrete their milk not directly onto their fur. Um, and the young will 
wrap it up from there. Um, I don't know why this picture is so blurry. It's the same. This is a fly post. There is one of those. But they kind of put that joke in there. Metatheria, there are marsupials. So kangaroos and possums um, that um, develop within um, you know, the marsupials um, pouch. These are, I believe, I believe this is a picture of a young kangaroo, if I'm not mistaken, um, that um, are very underdeveloped at birth. Um, they're, all, they're practically embryos still. As um, they're developing, they have to stay in the marsupial pouch. Um, otherwise, they have no way of um, being in those They have no way of sustaining themselves and maintaining homeostasis to keep themselves alive. Um, so they have to stay in this pouch until they're more developed because they're more or less birthed you know, very, very, very prematurely. As a side note regarding possums, I think most of us imagine possums to be the ones we see crawling around our backyards, getting into our trash cans. Um, they are the Americas' only marsupial. They are they can't get rabies. They do a very great job of eating pigs, which produces Lyme disease in both us, our furry friends, such as dogs and cats, and over here. They eat a ton of insects and other pests. So next time you see a possum, um, you should be very thankful because it is doing a lot of good work for you. Um, yeah, marsupials, just kangaroos and possums. Baby kangaroos are really cute. They do have nipples, but they are feeding off of. So, unlike mock trains. Yes, there are koalas in here too. If you are in my lab, you will know that I hang out with koalas. Uh, and I will not speak as to why here, but if you want to talk to me about why I hate koalas, you can talk to me in the class. <laughs> I think. No, 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 no. And then finally, is there eutheria or our true mammals? Our true placental mammals. This is where we belong. We have um, this. You know, we have placental uh, gestation. We keep our young um, inside of us for a very long time to complete, to completely develop. Um, there's various different species and um, families and genera that have various stages of development of development that the young occur with. So, horses, for example, the young are pretty much. Newborn horses are ready to go right when they get there. They are ready to get off and running. They can support themselves. They can eat their own food. They can do everything compared to something like our human children, which are more or less little gremlins that we have to completely take care of for the first like eight years before they can like, really do anything of themselves. Furry friends are in here too. Dogs. This dog got got by a porcupine, unfortunately, but uh, dogs are in here. Grizzly bears, Kodiak bears, which are a really interesting group of organisms in and of themselves. I'm actually terrified of grizzly bears. Um, these guys can run at like 30 to 40 miles an hour. And if I did the math right, um, the Detroit Zoo is about 30 miles away from here, so if a bear got out, it's waiting outside for me to pray about them. Our primate cousins, um, I'm not sure um, uh, Liliana's here, maybe she'd be able to uh, tell me what species. This is our primate cousins. I don't have any pictures of humans because I think you can all look to your left and right to see that we are, um, what a human looks like. And of course, finally, the mighty wolverine is a Ethereum. Yeah. All our mammals are synapsids. They all have an amniotic, either an egg or an development. All those amniotes Amphibians or tetrapods have four limbs uh, that are related to fishes because they are sarcopterians. As I like to say, they're all fishes, and fishes all the way down to river. That's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for listening.